This explosion here, it happened in Irpin, just north of Kyiv, when Emil Giesen and a group of journalists came under mortar fire when attempting to check on a burning building. Emil and the group made it back to safety, and we are so glad that he is with us live tonight from Kyiv. We welcome documentarian Emil Giesen. Am I pronouncing your last name right? Pretty good, Giesen. Gason, okay. Um, we know it is dark and early for you in the capital city of Kyiv just after 5 a.m. on your Tuesday morning. As you've heard the reporting here from Los Angeles, we're saying that it's the conditions there are seemingly getting worse and worse. Can you verify that? Is that what you are in fact seeing on the ground? Yeah, hundred percent. Um, as day go day by day, is the Russians are advancing closer to the capital city Kyiv. Also in the east, the Russian advancement is going, as Putin says, to plan. They seem to be taking key locations. The bombing has been intensified in, in Kiev, especially to the north. And that footage you've just seen of me in Irpin, that was less than 48 hours ago now. And yesterday, a group of journalists I know, British guys, ran into the Russians and came up to their checkpoint by mistake, and the Russians searched them and then sent them back on their way. So pretty much that region where I was is now under control of Russia. Oh, my goodness. And as you said, that's just north of Kiev and Irpin. So walk us through this moment here. I mean, you are literally in the war zone trying to bring us these images. Yeah, so I was with a group of um, journalists there, and what we what we did, we went up to the edge of Irpin, where there's there's thousands of civilians that are trapped, and they're currently struggling to get out of the town. So what the Ukrainian army are doing is when there's the bombing stops, they're sending as many civilians through across the the broken bridge as they can. We pushed up a little bit further into that town there, as you can see, that little village towards that burning building, and then we started coming under um, a heavy mortar fire. That incident there actually killed four civilians when one round landed on the other side, probably about 100 metres from us. So, yeah, they are indiscriminately just bombing that area. Russia has announced that its humanitarian corridors opened up so civilians can leave, but this isn't always adhered to by troops on the ground, potentially because some of the Russian troops aren't getting a message that there's a ceasefire, we're continuing firing, or they're returning fire from the Ukrainians that are engaging them. So really, there's so much confusion on the battlefield, there's so many troops there. And I, I'm, a, I'm a former Royal Marine commander. I served in Iraq and Afghanistan myself. I've covered wars, Iraq, Syria, Ukraine, and the war in Artsakh um, between Armenia and Azerbaijan. But this war is a massive war on a scale that there's so many troops on the battlefield. There's continuous bombardment. Even before coming live on air, there was a large explosion. It's 5 o'clock in the morning here, um, probably about a mile to two miles from me. So, yeah, Kiev is very much encircled. There's only one route out, and that's to the south currently at the moment. And civilians are continually messaging me through my Instagram, asking me, can I assist, help them out? And I'm trying to do my bit at the same time as being a filmmaker here, is trying to help people get to safety, to the train station, which trains are still running. You captured a, a lot of those civilians literally running from for their lives. Here's some of your video that you shot just in the last day here. Uh, these people are from a nearby village village north of Kyiv, I suspect. Uh, go ahead and, and did you talk to any of them as they as they make their way? Where are they headed? And also you, you shot some harrowing images of children and babies. Mm. Yeah, so like you mentioned earlier, martial law has been declared. And martial law means that men between the age of 18 to 60 have to volunteer to go to the army. So majority of the people that are trapped are the women and the children, as you can see there. And they were just waiting for a respite in a moment, like you see they're handing over the older women to the soldiers, the kids. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a really dire situation. And speaking to them, they just want peace. Everyone I speak to just says they want Russia and Putin to stop attacking because they don't really understand why their neighbor is being such an aggressor currently at the moment. But what happened with these people is they will move out of the danger zone, move to Kiev, and then from Kiev they'll try to get to the Polish or Hungarian border where there's hundreds of thousands of pit civilians that have moved across and are totally displaced because of this war. 
Yeah, almost uh, two million refugees trying to get to those border crossings uh, around the country. It, uh, for those who are choosing to stay, a lot of them have taken up uh, the metro shelter, literally going underground. We have some of those images that you captured as well. Uh, a, a mom and, and uh, two young kids in a tent. Uh, she's literally feeding them. Uh, this little girl holding a stuffed animal. Uh, it's just so heartbreaking. Are you getting a sense of how they're feeling? I mean, you just said for yourself they wanted to stop. Are they feeling hopeful? The, the things with the Ukrainians, there's a massive spirit here that they're going to win the war and victory. And but none of them know how long it's going to last. And that's the key. The key issue here is the uncertainty of how long they're going to be living underground, how long people are going to have to be outside of Ukraine in Poland or Hungary. Really, no one knows what's going on here. And because all these people just want to go back to their normal life. And it is heartbreaking when you're seeing these children so young, they, they don't really understand what's going on. They think it's like an adventure, um, living in the metro station, like they're going on a vacation. Um, but really, no one knows what's going on. That's the massive uncertainty here because everyone wants calm, everyone wants the bombs to stop dropping and Putin to withdraw his troops from Ukraine. I want to go back to And the also, go yeah, ahead. and one of the, the biggest issues that people are talking about here is the new fly zone. Mm. Everyone keeps saying, everyone's, everyone's quite receptive and happy to see me being a British person here because Britain and the United States have been very vocal against Putin. But what they do say is they, they want NATO to implement a no fly zone over the city and over the country so the bombs stop and the planes stop dropping bombs. But NATO has said that the, it's not going to do so. Even the U.S. Uh, mm. has said that uh, they won't establish a no fly zone out of fear that that's literally going to start World War III. So, how do the Ukrainians feel uh, about the U.S. response? Yeah, that, that's a great point. Is we know that that could trigger World War Three and escalate the whole conflict, but the people on the ground don't see that. They just see what's going on in their world, and they're saying we need the West to stop Russia from flying their planes, dropping their bombs, um, and it's, it's this tough one because. Seeing it day to day is heartbreaking that a lot of these civilians they don't really understand the bigger picture. They just want it their war to stop the war to stop here in their own country. But throughout the day yesterday, bombs are dropping, they're getting nearer, the Russians are encircling the city. So it's only a matter of time before potentially the Russians assault Kiev the capital. You could document a lot of uh, things, a lot of topics. Why do you choose to document war, Emil? Uh, that's a great question. <laughs> Why? Um, I should do holiday videos or something like that. <laughs> I wouldn't go to the Caribbean. But really, it's mainly it's my background because I'm, I'm a former military man. I, I was a Green Beret. So war, I've been in war since the age of 18. I understand war. I know how to conduct myself in war. Um, and not only that, it's, it's, it's getting images and showing the world what is going on. And even though war is terrible, there is still good in war. There's people, people's spirits, how people adapt to it. There, there is, there is light in the darkness, and that's what I do with all my documentaries. I see the humanization of what's going on. Potentially, with here, I w might not be making a documentary on on this war here. I'm just more reporting at the moment, um, unless there is an assault onto Kiev, and then I, that's my main objective is to film the assault on the Kiev, but really, yeah, it's just telling people stories in a humanization way. I think that's important. Uh, we only have a few more seconds left, but I do want to ask you, you are putting yourself at risk. Uh, when do you decide to go home? Yeah, a lot of journalists at the moment, um, fears kicking in with the bombs dropping and intelligence that the attack on Kiev is coming. So quite a few journalists are now thinking about leaving. For the time being, I do my own risk assessments on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. Um, I'm going to stay for the time being, um, and I'm just playing it by ear. Once the situation is too much and too dangerous, I then try to extract myself out of the country. But like we're saying, as the days go on, it's getting very much harder for civilians and people like myself, journalists, to leave the city. Well, we thank you for your bravery uh, in bringing us those images. As hard as it is to see, uh, you are our eyes and ears of the war. So thank you so much, Emil. You can follow him on Instagram at Emil Giesen.